Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this session on non-communicable diseases. Uh, my name is Volkmar Falk, and I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, I'm not an expert in the field, and that's why I'm very happy that um, I have a panel of experts with me that is going to discuss in the next uh, 90 minutes the challenges of non-communicable diseases in developing countries. As you know, the rates of death due to infectious diseases and early infant deaths are declining thanks to uh, intervention and better treatments. Uh, but at the same time as the um, population ages, also in developing countries, cardiovascular diseases uh, are on the rise. As a matter of fact, one out of two Africans at age 25 or older uh, suffers from hypertension. And the death toll to the cardiovascular diseases in developing countries is almost one-third of the population below 70. So it is a growing problem, and uh, up to now we have only very few solutions. So the idea of this uh, uh, session is to develop uh, some thoughts on how we can tackle this problem, how to diagnose, how to prevent, and eventually how to treat and provide sustainable treatment in countries that have not full infrastructure, not full access to medical therapy, and so on. Um, the session is organized uh, in a way that all the panelists will give uh, five to six minutes of an introduction to various topics related uh, to the issue, and then we will have, uh, hopefully, a lively discussion. So I would like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Fiona Edset. Um, she's Director of Wellbeing and Public Health at Bupa, where she's responsible for the clinical leadership of prevention and partnerships. Uh, previously, she was Director of Chronic Disease and Health Promotion at the World Health Organization, and she has five years' experience as Deputy Chief Medical Officer and Director General in the UK government. Uh, there she was responsible for health improvement and health inequalities. She's an international advisor on the European Union, World Bank, and WHO programs, and many more. But uh, we don't want to waste time with introductions and would like to hear your thoughts. Thanks very much, and I'll, I'll speak from here. Um, what I want to talk about is actually an opportunity to broaden our thinking around how where health happens. Um, for non-communicable diseases, there's something that really people have to cope with in their everyday lives um, and where they work and where they live and um, where they play. So one of the areas that um, we in Bupa have been exploring with the NCD Alliance is the potential for workplaces, employers, businesses around the world to impact on people's health. Why do we think this is important? Because we know that obviously people who are economically active are absolutely critical to governments in terms of taking forward the economy. We know that the impact, um, even in middle-income countries, of people with non-communicable diseases is about seven trillion a year, the impact that it has on reducing economic activity. So it's important to countries and it's important to governments. But it's also important to people. We know that if you um, have cancer, you are only likely, only two-thirds of people never return to work after having cancer. And that's not because they're too ill to, it's because often organizations don't support them or they're discriminated when they're at work. We know likewise that half of all stroke sufferers are un in unemployment or unemployed a year after they've had a stroke. So there's a huge opportunity here. We also know, very importantly, that workplace health programs work, and they work both for companies, so that if you look at companies who over the last 14 to 15 years have been leaders in workplace health, their ranking on the um, stock market is about 300% more than their competitors. So it's a really good business case. But we also know that actually people themselves can really benefit from this. And for every one dollar invested in workplace health programs, you get three back. And people really um, can have their lives transformed in the workplace. 
So do people want to do anything about this? Well, employees by and large expect more from their employers than they get. And workplaces, um, employers themselves say that they would like in over two thirds of cases to improve what they provide at work. But the stark reality today is that only about a third of workplaces actually have any workplace health programs around the world. So I see that as a huge opportunity for us to think about workplaces as a way to really improve people's health. And so very briefly, I want to touch on four areas where we might be able to do that. And there are some very practical examples in the NCDA Alliance report that came out earlier in the year in May. The first is to, um, to promote dialogue across sectors, and Oleg and colleagues will be talking more about that, but to really use existing relationships at a national level to draw in employers and to think about what they can do to improve health. There are lots of examples in the past from HIV and AIDS, where with the ILO and others, charters and programs have been developed to really improve people's health. There's a lot also that we can practically do in a second area, which is actually to improve delivery in the workplace. So you'll be aware of lots of examples of smoke-free um, workplaces, where there are huge opportunities to improve people's health at work, to improve their diet or their physical activity. And we know, for example, in our Spanish business, that when the Spanish government brought in smoke-free legislation in 2006, it actually allowed us as a business to go further than um, we had before, so that we actually also prevented smoking in all our hospital grounds, not just in the buildings, and we actually provide all our employees with extra programs. So legislation um, and support for employers practically can make a big difference. We also know that there's a huge amount we can do to support people returning to work, whether it's talking to employers about how we change people's work patterns, how we support their colleagues to understand what it's like to return to work with heart disease or cancer, and to provide practical vocational um, support. But we also know at an economic level that there's quite a lot you can do to provide incentives at a governmental level. So an example of a program that happened in the UK was a cycling to work scheme where over half a million employers, half of which were small businesses, participated in this. Over 90% of employers said that they really felt it had a positive impact on health and likewise for employees too. So, I really want to draw to um, a conclusion from my brief remarks to say that if we think broadly about how we can provide access to health, to think about the whole economy, what we can do in partnership, to think about the role of businesses as over half of people are in employment, there's a huge amount we can do to not only work with governments, to think about improving practical delivery for people in their everyday lives, in workplaces, and in the way we incentivize that, then we can have a big impact because there's a huge opportunity out there with practical programs to improve people who are living every day with heart disease, cancer, and other non commute diseases. I'd be very happy to talk about some practical examples when we get on to the um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now we have a short overview about the role of workplaces in NCDs, and now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Anne Ertz, uh, right next to me. She's uh, the head of the Novartis Foundation. Uh, since uh, 2013. Before that, she held different positions at Novartis um, and previously worked as director of the Lung and Tuberculosis Association in Belgium and as head of the Health Science Department in the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva. She also served as a health coordinator for the ICRC in several countries. So she will talk about cardiovascular diseases in low-income settings, demand innovation in healthcare delivery, more than delivering innovations in healthcare. A nice introduction. And um, yes, I would like to speak a little about how it's necessary in low income settings to think about how we deliver health services instead of only delivering new innovations. In fact, the scope of global health, um, is the challenge we face today is unprecedented. We have rapid urbanization and increasing poverty rates that go together with that and an unfinished agenda of infectious diseases and modern child health issues. 
while we face a constant threat of new emerging diseases, as we have now again with uh, Zika. But at the other side of the crossroad, there is this enormous rising tide of non-communicable diseases. And non-communicable diseases are not anymore the diseases of the rich. They have become the diseases of the poor. 80% of the morbidity and the mortality of uh, non-communicable diseases occurs in low-income settings, meaning that uh, four out of five deaths due to non-communicable diseases um, happen there. Hypertension, for example, on its own is responsible for about 10 million deaths a year, and that's as many deaths as all infectious diseases combined. We know, however, that health services or health systems in low-income settings are insufficiently prepared to address this dual burden of disease of infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases, and it's enough to look at the map of the number of doctors per population to know uh, why there is such an inequity in addressing these problems. So we at the Novartis Foundation um, find that this calls for an innovative way of how we deliver health services because drugs only are not enough if there are no services to make sure patients get the drugs and get the desired outcomes of the medicines they need, then it won't work. So this is our focus area at the foundation. Besides our legacy work in eliminating leprosy and malaria, which we won't give up because uh, we are not there yet, but um, the main area of our focus is uh, on how to innovate health service delivery for hypertension and cardiovascular complications. We measure everything we do so that we can apply and readjust our programs accordingly to the findings. And for example, we have two models to address hypertension in a very innovative way, bringing um, the, the prevention, obviously, yes, but also screening, diagnosis, and first-line treatment outside of the health system. In fact, we are bypassing the primary health care system, which is overloaded with acute care and is only geared towards acute care. We try to bring treatment for hypertension and, first of all, um, the detection of high blood pressure outside of the health system in shops, gas stations, bus stations, um, in the local pharmacies, and we train the shopkeepers to deliver the right information. Now, this program in Ghana is called COMHIP, is uh, uh, just above Accra, is a very small, relatively small program as we have set it up in the form of a clinical trial to really measure the efficiency of this. But the one in Ho Chi Minh City is rather big. It's immediately uh, covering a large part of the city and based on a similar approach with social entrepreneurs responsible for screening and first-line treatment. Now, um, we know that this can work. Building a nice model, then build the evidence. The only choice we have at that time when the evidence is there is turn to the government and say, please, now scale this nationwide. Here's the, the track record of the thing. It works. Please scale it. And we know that can work, but it takes between five and eight years, and we don't have that patience anymore. In fact, we built all of our programs around digital health, and I forgot to say that about the COMHIP and the Vietnam program, but digital health is definitely the enabler to really empower patients, expand access, but also improve quality of care because you can centralize expertise and coach less skilled health workers by phone or by, um, by FaceTime. But also you can base your decisions on real-time data. So digital health has to be the motor or the enabler behind the innovation of health service delivery. And as I said, we are impatient. We don't want to have this isolated impact in some uh, areas of the cities uh, in the world um, and working with partners on the ground is important, but what we now want is really build a major partnership in major uh, megapolis cities um, to really address the problem of hypertension and its underlying factors jointly with a shared goal, a shared measurement system, but bundling expertise and bundling resources of private sector partners such as the food industry, the telecommunication industry, the healthcare industry, and uh, many others, insurance companies, together to think about new ways of making health services for cardiovascular disease 
um, affordable and available in those settings. And we want to do that in a way that it's sustainable at scale. So for that, we need to have business models that work, otherwise it will never scale rapidly enough. And these are the partners we would like to bring round the table. We do this, of course, all based around the reality of patients and their families. So patients have to be in the center of the solution, but the, uh, the party of partners around the table has enlarged drastically. So we do this with the mayor, of course, of the city, but also with uh, uh, local employers who want to start workplace programs, for example, as uh, Fiona just mentioned, it's extremely important to build the case for governments that it can be done, that non-communicable diseases can be tackled in their country. And we work with um, food, food sector, as I said, but also uh, with many other urban planners. Architects are very important. And it's not easy to bring them all around the table, but together we co-create the solutions. And we hope that this brings the innovations that countries need to address the dual burden of disease. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we would like to continue with uh, Dr. Oleg Chesnov. Um, he is the Assistant Director General for Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health. Um, and um, the deputy, before he was Deputy Director of International Relations at the Ministry of Health and Social Development of the Russian Federation. He's a physician, has worked in the World Health Organization for many years, and has also um, set the first global ministerial conference on healthy lifestyles and non human medical diseases control, which finally resulted to the Moscow De uh, Declaration in Non Communicable Diseases which was endorsed by the World Health Assembly in 2011. He will uh, give a short overview about uh, access to non-communicable disease management and as an essential element of the WHO Global NCD Action Plan. Thank you, Chair. A couple of the slides, which are just obvious slides. Uh, this is the figures, which you, can, you can use this later. This is official uh, figures, you can see uh, cardiovascular diseases in the old picture. So it's not necessary to have uh, any comments to this slide. Next is uh, what I want to share. Inside of this is important to draw your attention that low and middle income countries, they, they have a, a quite, uh, quite a serious uh, challenge because if developed countries have money at least, uh, not develop, uh, uh, low and middle income countries, they must have some vision how we are going to support them. Because next slide is explaining that uh, situation in the world so different and so broad uh, between deep blue and uh, red color, you can see uh, this is a, a picture in the country level is absolutely different. We are focused especially on the age between 30 and 70 uh, because it's a uh, most of the dead can be premature. Uh, some people say to us, why not children, they are not elderly, but they are also in the picture. But uh, we are start, we must start somehow, and we draw attention. It's most important um, uh, uh, population between 30 and 70, where, where they have a uh, very big economical impact for the future of the country. Next slide. Uh, this is if you take a, take a look at this uh, uh, trend, epidemiological trend, you can see uh, that this is a, uh, we in the developed country, we try to, we have a decline. But if you take a low country with low income, you have a, a increasing. The next slide is illustrate you this one, especially between women and men. And uh, you can see that uh, it's absolutely uh, clear gap between uh, two parts of the uh, uh, world. Uh, next slide. Hmm. Uh, I think this is important to draw your attention that, uh, of course, prevention and risk factors is, and also social determinant. But we are mainly focused on, the, on, the, on medic, me, medic, uh, medical treatment. Next slide, please. This is a gap where we see a uh, uh, problem and we are going to concentrate our efforts on these uh, areas. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a slide more uh, important already 
from point of view give you helicopter view what is going on because you can see this uh, meeting like a fragmental meeting, like a big puzzles, and you have only one small puzzle sitting here, and you can feel that we are isolated. We are not isolated in this discussion. If you take a uh, political declaration of 2011, uh, it took five years to complete political architecture for the NCD, not only cardiovascular disease, but also for NCD. And my predecessors, 10 years work very hard to take attention of the politicians. So finally, it's happened. Uh, I don't want to use this historical step forward, but it is very significant step forward. Why? Because first time, health agenda was discussed in the uh, New York level, where UN uh, discussion it is not a minister of health anymore. It's uh, prime minister and, and the presidents. And they decide... And, to take more attention to NCD, and we have a political declaration, and we have assignment for WHO, and we have a, also commitment for the country. So what we are talking in our, uh, 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 in our presentations, we are talking how to engage country. This is uh, exactly what happened five years ago, that we have a political uh, uh, declaration when we try to engage government to pay more attention. But how to have more attention? You have a climate changing, you have a, uh, a migra migrants, you have a, uh, environment issues, air pollution, and, uh, and uh, country security. I think this is important to be not last in the queue who is knocking to the door to the Minister of Finance and Minister of uh, Prime Minister. Global Action Plan, it's still, mm, definition is plan, but uh, plan is, uh, is still a political document, but after, when we develop this uh, national pl action plan, we um, have at least guidelines how to develop national plans on the national level. So finally, uh, now 146 countries which have a national plan. We spent also a couple of years for this. Somebody can say slow, but uh, uh, it's never happened before. And the global target is uh, till 25, to include 25 reduction of premature mortality for NCD, include uh, cardiovascular disease. What is mean? And this is a people between 30 and 70. It's a quarter of them. We can not a safe life, but you can say safe life. But how can we, we are measurable? How I'm going to report to the Pan Ki Moon or next Secretary General in case if it's not happened? It can't happen because we are not developed uh, agency, and in case if country will be not engaged. So, about how to engage prime minister to pay attention. This is a good uh, example where politicians have a difficulty and resistance. But we have a continued pressure and argue that our agenda is very important. Addis Ababa action, uh, Addis Ababa action agenda, it was, you know, that's mainly. Uh, it's uh, for sustainable goals or millennium goals in the past, but uh, we're kitchen for the how to share money for global agenda. We never participate in the past in this kitchen, but now we are present there and we raise our flag and say health is not last. Maybe not number one for your priority, but definitely not last. And finally, uh, sustainable development goals. It's, it's true that we are not Finnish agenda for the communicable diseases. Uh, but for us, who is doctors, we know border between communicable disease, non-communicable disease is very thin. Maybe we are still using this terminology, but I hope very soon it's disappeared. So uh, next slide is illustrate more what uh, I said before. Just look on the top only. Don't look through this uh, massive information which can be useful for you in your reporting system. High politician, presidents, and prime minister uh, finally in the summit 2015 decide to include health like a target number three. Sorry, global goal number three. And, uh, and they pick up our formula. They just increase uh, till uh, not 25, 25%. Uh, they put it as just one third, 2030. It's uh, demonstrate trust to the WHO and to the country level that we are on the right way. Next slide. Um, 
recently, no, not to only talking, just let's say, see what we are doing. Uh, this is a slide that uh, uh, can uh, demonstrate uh, that WHO are looking to have a global partnership, and we launched and recently, in two weeks ago, in New York, new initiative with, uh, we, we, together with Bloomberg and uh, uh, with U.S. government and uh, many, many partners uh, who support this idea, and we are starting from the cardiovascular diseases very seriously. So, next slide. Uh, this is the structure of this initiative, and you can see also previous anti-tobacco actions, Empower, which is uh, financing uh, by Bloomberg Philanthropy, and we see that this is, we, we, we want to have a comprehensive uh, partnership around uh, this uh, uh, initiative. Next slide. This is uh, how it is, looks like. And uh, Andreas, could you show this uh, just uh, uh, booklet? Uh, we, we, we can distribute this. Just look at this. It's one of the small elements of action, and not only talking. So, and I think that money will be available, but money will be available for actions, and not for the just blah, blah discussion. So, next. <clears throat> well, this is a quite well-known uh, slide. Uh, what is priority? I'm not... Uh, uh, I'm gastroenterologist, not a cardiologist. Uh, I can tell you that this is a uh, much better uh, cardiologist, uh, much better know where, where gap is and what this is access to the medicine. Myself, I already using uh, some uh, uh, pills uh, which is, uh, uh, protect my level of cholesterol. So, but a lot of people don't, don't have this access to the medicine. Next slide. Uh, no conclusion, I think this is very important, what you can remember after my presentation and uh, what we will contribute to, uh, to this summit, not only our session, but to the summit. So a couple of the conclusions, is, uh, which is obvious, it's now a right time for action. We have a highest level of attention for high politicians. They understood maybe communicable diseases obviously killing people and it is need to have a, a lot of the actions. And the Zika is just uh, one of the examples. We have also Ebola uh, and also HIV before, tuberculosis, malaria, poliomyelitis is still not irradiated. We continue. But at the same time, politicians know that bourbon of not communicable diseases destroyed the economy any rich country. If it's continue like this, you don't have enough money to cover all expenses for non-communicable diseases. Uh, bridging gap uh, in low and middle income country, it's need to, to raise attention to developing agency. DFID, CEDA, and UNA, U, 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 USID, uh, many agencies uh, uh, contribute a lot of the attention to the different area, but we feel that uh, cardiovascular disease is still uh, neglected. Uh, partnership, it's also an uh, obvious uh, uh, conclusion. It's important to have a partnership, but how to be conductor of the conductors? Once, I only in the, my life, I have experienced one, one conductor conduct as a conductor in the music orchestra. I thought so it is in the Red Square, where a lot of the country sent military orchestras, and one gross or big uh, uh, conductor conduct as a conductor, as they conduct orchestras. So how to conduct all of you in case if you are, have a, an agenda? And business have a, one agenda, they have a profit-orientated agenda, we have a health-orientated agenda, public health have other government, they have authority, scientific, scientific. So I think this is a real challenge, and the, my conclusion is very simple. Let's start thinking about how to have a conductor of conductor. We still don't have a global government. We don't have yet global parliament. And everybody is using the situation how they want. And number four is, uh, I think, is more important uh, conclusion. It's uh, uh, financing uh, to investment. Uh, if you are talking about innovation, the uh, title of the forum is, uh, is uh, Scientific Innovation and, and policy. Uh, site of the, uh, of the uh, title of the summit, sorry. Uh, innovation. 
if we are moving from financing Ministry of Health, which is uh, it's true that all Ministry of Health is they are not Ministry of Health, they are Ministry of Diseases. Why? Because uh, they, they, they have 95% of money only for the disease control. So we are just continue uh, fi uh, financing. But uh, uh, first time I heard 15 years ago from the Chirac, President of France, who said, let's stop financing health system, let's invest. Business people know what is mean investment, but we still don't know. And challenge of the innovation is how we are understanding investment. We are not talking about it. My last conclusion, I think also, talking about policy. Too early if we are shifting paradigm. Because vision and, and conception is before policy. But if we are shifting paradigm, we must think about how, how to have, what is the new vision, what is the conceptually we are understanding our future. Because health is not anymore property only on the Minister of Health. And I think each prime minister must be a little bit minister of health. From this point of view, policy must be taken very seriously. But before poor policy, we must have a discussion about conception, vision, and new paradigm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. From this more global view, we come back to a more practical problem which deals with the access to uh, optimal medical therapy and engaging the pharmaceutical industry. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jay Iyer. She is currently Executive Director uh, of the Access to Medicine Foundation. Previously, she served as the Head of Global uh, Health and Scientific, uh, Chief Scientific Officer of this organization um, before she was co-founder and strategic program manager of the European Solutions Enterprise for uh, Neglected Diseases. Jay. Right. Thank you very much for the invitation. So today I'm going to speak to you a little bit about some of the programs that we've observed in our work. My name is Jay Iyer and I lead the Access to Medicine Foundation. Um, our main idea is that there are 5 billion people who today have access to medicine and we only have 2 billion people that we still need to reach with our initiatives. So um, I represent a foundation that is independent, based in the Netherlands. Uh, we um, use a multi-stakeholder approach and we develop something called the Access to Medicine Index. Uh, the next one will be published in November this year. And what we try to do is we build a multi-stakeholder consensus on what we want to expect from the pharmaceutical industry um, and look at where incentives and disincentives exist. And then we stimulate a race where companies um, bring the best foot forward and present their practices to us. And we evaluate those practices and, um, and score them on, on how well they do on access to medicine. And then we also diffuse best practices, so there is a platform where both the industry can learn from each other and multiple stakeholders can, can engage with the industry to, to determine which are the best programs that are most appropriate for use in their environments. So um, our core of our work is Access to Medicine Index, um, and we also publish various different uh, thematic studies on key topics. Uh, we'll also be publishing an Access to Vaccines Index, looking at the role of the vaccine manufacturers. And of course, we're involved in, in various areas of advancing the debate. Um, it's important to measure the progress in the pharmaceutical industry uh, um, and uh, to several different stakeholders. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry uses this kind of work to um, identify where they stand among their peers. Uh, multiple funders and global health stakeholders use this to advance their priorities and see whether the pharmaceutical industry is meeting, meeting some of the um, plans that they've, they've put forward. And, of course, investors in the pharmaceutical industry, um, uh, we're always constantly speaking to them about how long-term sustainable solutions are uh, necessary for uh, implementing in order to solve the problem of the two billion to go. So, um, the last few years, we've had many debates and discussions about um, cardiovascular diseases. And today, I'm going to be speaking to you about some of the practices from the pharmaceutical industry that we've observed from our work. Now, many of you would, would uh, appreciate the fact that, um, that the combined sales of antihypertensive and antihyperlipidemic uh, drugs at the moment sit at around 50 billion a year, which is, makes it the second largest therapeutic area after oncology. And this represents two things. It represents the fact that there are many key products that are there from the pharmaceutical industry that are important to solve the needs of, of, uh, of people all around the world. And also it brings to mind uh, the importance of affordability of some of these medicines for resource poor settings. 
So the largest companies that are currently active in, um, in, in producing some of these medicines are the ones that we are tracking. Um, and the largest uh, companies are AstraZeneca, Sanofi, Merck, MSD, um, uh, Daiichi Sankyo, Pfizer, Novartis, Bayer, Takeda. So the, it, it goes downwards after that point. Um, and most of you would remember the legacy of a uh, drug like Lipidor, which is a hyper anti hyper uh, lipidemic uh, medicine from uh, Pfizer and how it took the world by storm. So to, I think when my colleagues here have already spoken about the key burden. The role of the pharmaceutical industry is typically looking at uh, three different areas where they intervene on access to medicine. Access to medicine involves bringing forward diagnostics if they have access to certain key diagnostics or working with diagnostic companies bringing medicine tech technologies like telemedicine to the table for all non-communicable diseases. Many companies are involved in screening, early detection, and awareness raising to, to improve both health-seeking behavior of patients and to advance the volumes of, of the products that can be sold in these markets. There's also key interventions in health system strengthening, and several companies are active in supporting registries, surveillance, um, and education of healthcare professionals. I want to talk to you about a few examples that we've seen from the many companies that we've observed. Um, some of the key examples that we've seen are actually centered around three companies uh, at the moment. Um, Sanofi, Novartis, and AstraZeneca. My colleague Ann has already spoken a little bit about Novartis' program, but I'll, I'll also speak a bit about uh, Novartis' access uh, portfolio, which was recently launched in Kenya and, and intended to, to expand it uh, in, in several other countries. And there it includes uh, various uh, hypertension, hypertension drugs like Valsartan and generic medicines uh, for heart failure. And some of the statins, for example, are included over there. And the idea with the Innovatis Access Program is to uh, um, uh, sell medicines for one dollar uh, a month for 15 drugs that are there, and several of those drugs uh, include hypertensive drugs. So um, this AstraZeneca is, is another company that's very active in, um, in cardiovascular diseases. Um, they try to combine product offering and uh, improving services in, in their work. Um, Healthy Heart Africa is the name of their program, and their aim is to treat 10 million people over the, over the next uh, 10 years, starting from 2014. And uh, at the moment, they're active in screening for hypertension. Um, they also are involved in opening a series of health facilities, uh, training healthcare workers, uh, diagnostics uh, for high blood pressure, and uh, treatment with discounted prices of the medicines that, uh, that AstraZeneca brings in. And of course, they're they are aligning with other partners who bring in other, other um, uh, medicines. And this is a partnership with AMREF, uh, in, in, uh, um, at least in Kenya. And of course, it's running now for in, in about 21 countries. Um, Sanofi is active in, in about uh, several different countries, for example, in Brazil, Egypt, and Cameroon. Uh, they are, uh, to intend to sort of have a program where diabetes and uh, tiered pricing for hypertensive drugs run hand in hand. So they've opened up several um, uh, key clinics around the world, and they have uh, campaigns to improve uh, the awareness of, of cardiovascular diseases among diabetes uh, uh, patients. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the key examples that, that we'd like to bring forward uh, to you. Uh, one important thing to remember is um, that actually we always speak a lot about what can we learn from the legacy of HIV in low middle income countries. And I'm actually, uh, we're looking very much forward to the outcome of some of, the, some of these discussions. An interesting piece of information is in 2016, uh, this year in September, there was a partnership that was launched between PEPFAR and AstraZeneca. Um, to look at HIV and hypertension across Africa. And the intention is to use uh, some of the existing <laughs> HIV clinics and interventions that, 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 that PEPFAR has been uh, setting up and try to combine the expertise and the interests of, of um, AstraZeneca's uh, programs in that. So moving forward, I mean, the role of the pharmaceutical industry is, is vast and varied. They are the innovators and producers of some of these key medicines and come in early in the supply chain of, uh, of the pharmaceutical um, uh, supply chain. So it's important to, to, to be clear about what we expect from the pharmaceutical industry, whether they should set uh, inclusive business models, whether they should be donating programs to the very poor um, who cannot afford uh, any health care at all. How do they engage with local stakeholders to make sure that their programs are sustainable and, and ethical and, and, and planned in a, in, a, in a proper way? And of course, how can they support some of the capacity building activities there? That's what my organization does. We uh, look at multiple stakeholders like yourselves and, and try to speak to you about what, do you, what would you like to see from the pharmaceutical industry in the next five years or um, many years, and we track that progress. Thank you very much.
So I think this is a lot of food for discussion already, but we will complete um, our introductory talks uh, with the presentation of Dr. Francis Smith. He works at the University of the Free State in Blancfontein, and he's the head of cardiothoracic surgery um, and um, has a large experience with both adult and pediatric cardiac surgery. Uh, he will talk about accessibility and affordability of cardiac services in Africa. Uh, thank you, uh, Fokwa. Uh, in this talk, I'd like to talk, uh, the, the, my topic is accessibility and affordability. And I just want to give you a brief introduction and then basically look at the, uh, the potential affordability uh, of treatment in Africa. As you know, there are about 1.1 billion people living in Africa, 860 million in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a young population with about 516 uh, million uh, of its population less than 25 years of age. If we look at cardiac disease challenges, we're basically talking about congenital heart disease, of which we have 2.7 to 3.4 million births per year, and 1.72 million at least requiring surgery, of which less than 1% have access to that. The second problem is rheumatic heart disease, where we have a million people living in sub-Saharan Africa with uh, rheumatic heart disease compared to 33,000 in the whole of the industrialized world. And we are facing a tsunami of cardiovascular, adult cardiovascular disease because of epidemiological changes associated with uh, rapid urbanization. Now, if you want to quantify the problem, just to give a perspective, uh, there might be a slight over-service element. Uh, there's uh, one cardiac unit for every 120,000 people in the United States, uh, as opposed to 1 to 33 million uh, in Africa. 1,000-plus uh, procedures in the United States, about 800 in Europe, and 18 per million in Africa. Uh, based on uh, the population of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the World Health Organization calculated about a 400 case per million uh, as a world uh, ideal. Uh, that would boil down to 340,000 plus cases per annum, of which we're doing less than 12,000 in Africa as a whole, sub-Saharan Africa I'm talking about. Um, and that's basically linked to a general disinterest of government uh, governments in Africa to invest in uh, non-communicable disease. Also, there was a conference in 2001 in Abaju where African countries, because of the low GDPs, committed 15% of their budgets to health care. Uh, at the moment, 2013, the average was 3.6, and only one country made it, that's Tanzania. Uh, and the piece of good news is that whereas the middle class was about 126 million in the whole of Africa in the 1980s, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the middle class now consists of about 270 million people, which means that there might be some funding things. I think, I think that it's a, a common cause that uh, prevention is the beginning of everything. So uh, the prevention of rheumatic heart disease makes sense, the early detection and treatment of con uh, congenital heart disease. And obviously we have a fantastic opportunity in Africa to prevent uh, uh, a, 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 a tsunami of uh, cardiovascular disease with coronary artery disease by preventative uh, strategies um, and treatment of hypertension, diabetes, etc. Now... As far as surgery is concerned, basically three models have been tried. South Africa developed a, a system which we, I'm excluding from most of the discussion because it's a, a developed along uh, lines that uh, we have 40 plus units and uh, uh, we're underserving the population. We projected 21 cases doing 8,500. Uh, uh, but in startup units, there have been three models. It's a fly in, fly out with everything included missions. Then there are missions with something left, be, uh, left behind where people still come from outside, but there's a, st a stable unit that looks after the aftercare and, and evaluation diagnostics of patients. And there there have been some examples of people who developed a stable unit like uh, 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 Manuel Antunes, uh, who's here uh, in Mozambique. The problem is that it takes years and years to develop these units, and they always remain low-volume units doing about 100, 150 cases uh, each. Now, if we look to Professor Falk, 
uh, I think he will agree that it doesn't make sense to have small cardiac units. The, you need big units because there's really no match for the quality, quantity, and cost that big units can deliver at, uh, compared to small units. So if we want to combine economies of scale and also attract well-qualified people and retain those people and have fit uh, professional teams, we need big units. A lot of South African professionals qualified in cardiovascular medicine basically have abandoned Africa and are practicing in Europe or the North Americas. Now, if you look at what is a big unit, uh, I think that the, nat the, the national health system, the NHS in UK, have to find a unit of about 1,000 as a cost-effective unit. So 1,000 cases with 800 to 1,000 adults, 200 to 250 pediatric cases, uh, with probably five cardiac surgeons looking at 500 to 1,000 thoracic cases with another three uh, thoracic surgeons with a complement of anaesthetist, ICU, and diagnostic people is required for a unit like that. That basically implies that there are no small units uh, implied in this system, in an ideal system, and probably one has to look at regional rather than national uh, uh, units, so that you have a unit in East Africa that functions as a large unit, one in West Africa that it functions as a, a large deferral unit, and one in Southern Africa. All these units would also be only three hours flight uh, apart. Now, the question is that this is all sort of a fancy story, but now, is there money? And that's basically what I want to focus on. Now, if you want to build a big system, you need investment. Now, where would it come from? I think the normal thing is to look at uh, um, multi multinational companies active in uh, uh, commodities in uh, African, typically in, in Africa, uh, as part of their social corporate investment. NGOs, the bigger the better, obviously. National or supranational uh, non-communicable disease taxes can be considered, considered on a regional basis, which doesn't exist at the moment. Um, and large projects can attract investment from banks like the World Bank and other banking institutions if there is a profit motive uh, and a payback uh, a possibility. Obviously, Insurance products are, very, uh, are not well developed in, in most of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but it needs to be developed, and one can focus on an in-hospital plan product, uh, which the, does exist in, in some systems, and it could be aimed at non-communicable disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, high-tech medicine, and membership could include individuals, one of the 250 million middle-class people, employees, of corporate or government uh, agencies, and the government can also participate on behalf of the indigent by in investing or joining uh, 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 an insurance uh, structure. Now, just to give you some sort of idea of the money that could be involved, uh, 250 million people at $1,000 per capita per year equates $250 billion. Uh, income in an insurance company, uh, $500 per year uh, per member equates uh, $125 billion. Now, um, if we look at, uh, that's uh, um, just to put it in perspective, if we look at a country like Nigeria with 178 million people, um, we, th we think that about 50 million can pay uh, for medicine, about 8.5 million are wealthy, 17 million middle class, and, and an additional 25.5 million can raise the money, and 70% unfortunately remains Indian, uh, indigent. But if we look at what happens in, in a lot of African countries, now I'm looking at Western African, and I'm taking Nigeria as an example. Uh, according to the Guardian, uh, the, the, the local newspaper uh, in uh, Lagos, uh, $1.3 billion went from Nigeria to, um, uh, in one year on medical tu tourism in 2014. The World Bank calculated this figure to be $500 million a year in 2012. And in uh, 2011, 47% uh, of Nigerian patients who, see, who had uh, out-of-the-country treatment uh, spent $260 million dollars on 18,000 patients in India, which means that they spend $14,500 per patient. Uh, now, if we look at the calculated cost of uh, a cardiac surgery in Nigeria, that comes to about $9,000. Uh, it means that for every 
nine thousand well for every a million dollars, uh, 100 to 120 cases could be done. And if we look at 100 million out of the 260 or 100 million out of the 1.3 billion they spend on uh, tourism, it would uh, translate to uh, uh, every 100 million to, uh, to 10,000 cases. So it could be, if we talk about 250 million, it's 30,000 cases. Uh, which is uh, just about half of the projected 68,000 cases that's uh, required. Now, how can this, if we have this bundle of money which is out there, is just uh, misdirected or misspent, how can systems work? Now, I suggest sort of two uh, systems uh, to try and reduce the infrastructural cost. If you use existing infrastructure, you're talking about uh, large facilities, which means that the training hospitals can be uh, revamped or a major private hospital needs to be built, which is a, a, a cost of about $100 million to equip it at a, at a, a reasonable level. But then basically two models can exist where you have a predominantly private model where the private, a private company runs the hospital, employs the people, runs the equipment, equips it, and uh, maybe 70% of the beds would be reserved to make money in order to have a tax ring fence system that could subsidize the indigent and 30% of uh, uh, the beds. The reverse system could also be worked in the public sector uh, but where the 30% private beds can subsidize the 70%, but I put it to you that I think the private system uh, might be better. I don't think there's any way that one can get to a reasonable impact in an African setup that is a serious impact without going the one big push uh, 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 approach. I think that a single tier system, uh, however unfortunate, is not going to be tenable. Small, small low-volume units are just not going to deliver the service and is cost-efficient and has retention problems. A lot of African surgeons, well-trained, come back to Africa. They become frustrated and move into other sectors. A lot of them actually become politicians, if you believe in. And uh, uh, so I suggest that one look at the, that we consider regional high-quality, high-volume units for which we need government buy-in because they need to support and participate in the health care, insurance and tax investment uh, and redirection of tourism budgets. Um, obviously, uh, there's uh, uh, the, the hub spoke system with diagnostic uh, uh, clinics. So in conclusion, uh, I think um, accessibility and affordability is sort of a sensibility challenge with uh, political determinants. This is a political challenge that requires critical mass buy-in from institutions that could involve uh, the African Union, politicians, multinationals, NGOs, pharmaceutical companies in terms of their marketing budgets could invest, private healthcare companies and individuals on a regional level or national level that would collectively support a sustainable service delivery training and research unit of excellence. Uh, India has done that, this in selected units, so it's not impossible, it hasn't, it's not as if it hasn't been done anywhere in the world. I think that we need to know that the models need to be flexible and sympathetic to local circumstances, and obviously ethical questions around rationing of services and those things need to be addressed. The, the alternative with NGOs and donors in small un units just cannot sustain national or regional programs, and I think that's uh, 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 the reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, I just learned that Dr. Chesnoff has to leave us. No? 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 Well, whatever. I, I start with you and then you decide. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, you were mentioning that there's a competition for attention for health versus other crises such as climate change, uh, local wars, and... Uh, all the many things that are ongoing. So how do you think we can put health on the agenda and make it really a top priority? Well, usually I, I, I'm quote uh, Sakrat who has uh, uh, tried it to describe what is mean health. Health is not all, but all without health is nothing. I think this is if you are deeply thinking about it. What if people not die? What is the next? Of course, security is people don't die, don't want to die. Maybe, maybe 
after 100 years or 120 years. But uh, we can't avoid this. But uh, to be healthy, this is a priority. And also economical impact is becoming more and more important to motivate high, high politicians, include money, access to the money. Because uh, I just want to repeat what I said. If you continue like this, it's a burden of non-communicable diseases can destroy any economy. Of course, it's not so obvious disaster like, uh, let's say, epidemic, like uh, Zika, like uh, uh, <clears throat> Ebola. But it's important to, to know that economically it is very costly. Um, you are also, um, we're very happy if you take questions. So there's microphones, so if you have questions to the panel, please come forward. Please, please step to the microphone, identify yourself and go to the microphone. I will start with one more question to um, Anne. You were mentioning that digital health is probably very important also to uh, distribute not only knowledge but enhance diagnostics and, um, and help preventing. Now you were very optimistic about this, but of course digital health requires an, an IT infrastructure which in most cases is not there. So how, how does that work out? Thank you. I really am a very strong believer in the, um, the power of digital health as, as a transforma transformational power. Uh, and indeed, there has to be an infrastructure. But um, in fact, I am also a member of the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development and chairing the working group on health there. And we are working on a way uh, of building some kind of guidance how countries where broadband is established, and it's in most of the world now, but not everywhere yet, um, how countries can institutionalize digital into their health systems. Because what happens all the time is that there's a lot of good intentions, good ideas coming up with apps, digital apps that serve one or two problems. Um, sometimes nurses even end up with eight phones for each disease, another one, because there's all different uh, digital applications. And you end up with a completely fragmented landscape of digital health applications. And then you, you to finish like Uganda, which decided to stop all these pilot projects and to really make digital part of its health system. It has to address the health priorities in the end. So I believe that if uh, governments take it seriously that digital can really address um, the, the priority health needs, it can work. But for that, you need cross-governmental collaboration, which is something very strange for many countries, as uh, ministries are used to working in silos, and the ICT minister doesn't necessarily talk to the health minister or the finance minister to the health minister. And that is what is absolutely the condition sine qua non. The infrastructure is the easy part. The establishment of the system is the difficult part. So that goes directly back to you, Dr. Chesnov. How, how get, do we get governments to work together uh, to in, improve the IT infrastructure to promote health care products? Once I participate in the BOOP initiative, and uh, you know this is uh, in New York, in London, London this is a uh, uh, business center, and they ask me the same questions. Uh, because when I was a, a doctor in primary care, during the one day I can care about uh, not 10, maximum 20 patients. By a digital system, I can achieve millions. We have uh, M-Health, like uh, one of the initiatives we launched uh, five years ago in the Costa Rica, using the mobile technology. And this is a help us to, 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 pe to help people who is, decide to quit smoking. Talking about pregnant women, uh, sometimes we see that women with this pregnant first time, they don't know that just they're in darkness, they, they don't have a healthy literacy. And we can send a lot of the messages and have uh, like nine months, like a paid patronage. It was a, we launched this initiative in the uni uh, United States. So I think this is talking about new data, big data, new, new digital system, uh, uh, telemedicine. We can save a lot of the money and make uh, investment cases much more cheaper, uh, like a contribution, and income is, will be much more higher. There's a question. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is uh, Michael Clagg, and uh, my background is in clinical medicine and public health. And I, I very much enjoyed the speakers. It was this great, great uh, uh, panel discussion. The focus was on clinical care medications, which is, I guess, the theme that was given. And that means that we didn't talk at all about primary prevention. Uh, you know, so the emphasis on case finding, getting people treated and on medication. I'd like the panel's uh, thoughts about uh, policy and other initiatives to prevent cardiovascular disease from occurring in the first place. Fiona, you want to start? Michael, thanks for your question. A, a really good point. I think we all kind of alluded to the importance of primary prevention, and I think you heard from the panel that you can do that in different ways. I mean, we've just heard about initiatives such as Be Healthy, Be Mobile, which is the partnership between WHO, um, commercial partners, and ITU, uh, the International Telecommunications Union. That's got a lot of examples of primary prevention in it. I obviously talked about the role of the workplaces because I think, you know, as, as you intimate, one of the challenges of primary prevention is that most of us, when we're healthy, get on with our lives. We don't worry about um, the non-communicable diseases we might get in the future. So part of the trick of it is to think about how do we build it into people's everyday lives, whether that's when they go to see their primary care physician um, by chance for other things, to so seize that opportunity through screening programs, the kind of program that Anne highlighted on hypertension um, detection, or in the workplace where you have the opportunity to get programs. I mean, Clearly, what you've said and what I think we all would recognize is true is that the impact you can have through primary prevention is huge. And as you will also know, um, the same interventions, whether it's stopping people smoking or physical activity or improved diet, will also help people who have already got the disease because secondary prevention with the same lifestyle and medication changes can have a huge impact. So I strongly support what you said, and that's why I think we need to think smartly. Um, as Oleg said, I think it's about a paradigm shift of thinking about where we do um, health. Um, so absolutely agree entirely that we have to think about primary prevention. The trick is re reaching people in their everyday lives when health isn't something that really motivates most of us. We want to get on to do the things we care about. Jay, you want to add something? And uh, then we have the next question. Please go yeah, ahead. So it's, uh, it's quite an, uh, a, a place where the, medicine, the pharmaceutical industry does not play a very strong role in primary prevention itself, as you can imagine. Uh, but what's really interesting here is, is that actually several companies are looking at some of the campaigns that are running within some of the uh, countries to see how primary prevention has been occurring and what does that do when it comes to uh, secondary care and, and treatment. Uh, one important um, uh, initiative, actually, which is run by the uh, International Federation for Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association is uh, a healthy habits uh, campaign, which is which looks at, uh, at multiple healthy habits and trying to improve the awareness of of, uh, of people who are living in, in, in several countries to to um, to understand uh, some of the prerequisite uh, risk factors that are there for uh, cardiovascular diseases and other uh, diabetes and several other areas. But it's an area where I think a lot of other private players uh, like Philips Healthcare and others are playing a role in. One, one more yeah, sentence. Just and then one sentence about this. No, please, please stay. Please Sorry. Stay. The, I fully support this idea that primary prevention is absolutely crucial, and this is the reason why um, we are looking for partners outside of the sector of, for, of health to really make uh, choices for populations living in urban low-income settings healthy by default. As you can imagine, for example, in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, the whole population that has just migrated to the city has no healthy food available at all. So there it's not about building health services, it's about building healthy food oases in the city where people can access healthy uh, healthier food than, than what they now have. So it is not easy to do that on a, on a global level. It has to be adapted to local contexts and with local partners around the reality of the persons living in those areas. So thank you for your patience, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the last uh, aspect of accessibility and affordability 
in developing countries is the most crucial because, uh, first of all, uh, one has to acknowledge uh, all the foundations, um, um, the, the pharmaceutical companies, and so on, that are contributing to a lot of research uh, all over. The, in fact, my own academy. Oh, by the way, I'm the president of African Academy of Sciences. Uh, my name is Adere Mekuku. We have a big platform in our academy for research on, on various aspects of health problems and so on. Now, after doing all this research, what are we getting in the countries, especially developing countries? Even the, a place like U.S. has its own problems because not everybody has access to insurance. You know that. So what I want to emphasize is that in addition to all this research and uh, uh, effort of the global community, we still have to emphasize to our countries that declarations are not enough. Uh, you know, Brazzaville Declaration, the Ethiopia Declaration, I mean, and so on, that they still have to put their money where their mouth is. For instance, there is no African country that has a well-organized insurance uh, procedure for its citizens. And a lot of people die every day from uh, diabetes, from high blood pressure, from, because only the elites and the middle class can afford to do anything in this direction. And there's no regular government organized checkup for individuals. And by the time many of these uh, 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 citizens get caught up in all these diseases, cancer and, so on, and also cancer and so on, it's too late. So I would like to appeal to the international community to continue to pressurize our governments uh, because in the ultimate, what they do is what affects the citizens, that there should now be some sort of insurance for citizens organized by these developing countries. The way it is done in advanced countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a very important comment. And uh, just to elaborate on this a little bit, I wonder, um, Francis, um, you were mentioning that uh, a cardiac surgical operation is about $9,000 in Nigeria. So you're all aware of the program of Dr. Shetty in India, where obviously you can do a cardiac operation for $1,500 uh, with obviously good quality care. So is that a model that would apply to other regions in the world? And what is it, what makes it successful? How, how come that in India it is possible, in other parts of the world uh, uh, this is still uh, uh, not possible? Well, I think that uh, uh, certainly the Indian model is a model that, that, that outperforms anything else in the world. Uh, uh, I think that the closest that uh, world figures get to that would be around about $6,000 uh, and the, the Indian price range is, uh, ranges between 1.5 and 2.5 uh, thousand with local content, uh, local uh, products, mass uh, uh, purchases in terms of the, the maximizing economies of scale in huge units. Uh, so uh, whether one, uh, one – part of the thing would be to duplicate the, the Indian uh, system with – uh, Indian products. Uh, that, so, I mean, that, that would be step one in the, in the, in the right uh, direction. Um, in terms of the... Maybe I should stop there. So, um, Manuel Antunes. Well, I enjoyed this uh, panel and the presentations. It's interesting. However, I found funny that in about 200 people there are three cardiac surgeons, at least in this, uh, in this room, and one can wonder why cardiac surgery is so important in India, and especially in Africa, for example. Uh, 
it's probably not the com non-communicable diseases, but the congenital heart disease that, that makes uh, the biggest impact because you see those children, unless you do something and no medication can do anything, they will die and cardiac surgery is the only way to do. My name is Manuel Antunes. I'm from, uh, from Portugal, worked in Mozambique for a long part of my life and also in South Africa. And now I continue, uh, Francis has alluded to that, going on back to Mozambique in Maputo where we... We, together with other NGOs, we establish a Maputo Art Institute, which is a small unit. It doesn't go on to what the, the suggestion of Francis was there, and that's where I'm a bit worried. For two examples. First, it is n not new. You know, one of our colleagues, well-known, um, established a unit a long time ago in the Ivory Coast, it was a regional thing, and uh, it didn't go further. Once he left, he is French. When he left, the things just sort of vanished. And if you can take the example of South Africa with the recent changes in, in political, uh, in, in political, uh, uh, political changes, you know, the first thing, because the, 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 the priorities change, uh, as you know, the, the cardiac surgical units in South Africa were told to scale down their activities because the priority was no longer that. that. So cardiac surgery is, is difficult unless there is a good will and, and uh, perspective on a, of a global region. My worry about your scheme and about the last discussion, I, I am convinced uh, I do cardiac surgery in Portugal for half of the price of what, is, of what it costs in Germany, for example using the same instruments, the same consumables. So you can scale down. You know, if you want to, to, to match the, these enormous needs, you, you can sort of make shortcuts that make it more affordable. The question is that doesn't this still, if you, if you have uh, three or four large un units, you said one in East Africa, one in West Africa, and one in Southern Africa, uh, doesn't it still just attract or, or will be directed to people in the middle class or upper class who, in any case, if they don't have it locally, they can go and fly somewhere else, to South Africa, for example. Uh, by the way, you remember uh, Robin Kinsley in Johannesburg wanted to create a, a regional center for, congenital, for treatment of congenital heart disease. Uh, and, and that still leaves those that, that the poor. And uh, in any case, it's also necessary to say that your figures uh, would be good if, if those people would be able to travel from their little villages 300 kilometers away to the normal centers. So you can reduce your figures to about half and it's probably still excessive. Okay, I mean, so don't you see the risk? I, t I end up here. The risk that with these big regional centers, you'll address only the needs of the middle or upper mid class and the upper classes and, and leave out no. the poorer patients. Yeah, yeah. I was. Thank you very much, Manuel. But I think we should go back from cardiac surgery, which is at the high end uh, uh, of the spectrum, tertiary care. And we, we were discussing other issues that are probably more important, which is. Um, uh, prevention, of course, but also building an insurance system that actually can pay for, uh, uh, the, for medication, diagnostics, and treatment. And even in the U.S., Obamacare was a big, big effort. So even in a developed country, to establish a healthcare system for the underprivileged is, is a problem. So how come that you have optimism that we can establish um, uh, an insurance system in, in less developed countries where corruption, as we heard in the last session, is a big problem. So I wonder what your thoughts on this are. Well, I think that it, I mean, I think you're right that if we're going to solve the problems we've been talking about this morning, we need a broad based approach, not only on prevention, as you highlighted, but also funding mechanisms. I think it is a challenge. I think that there are novel funding mechanisms out there, which are partly, as colleagues um, have alluded to, around taxation for um, you know, tobacco is one way of getting money into the health system, and it's something that WHO and the World Bank have been looking on in recent years. I think there are opportunities to look at novel insurance mechanisms. There are some actually coming 
coming out of um, collaboration across sectors. So, for example, mobile phone providers, um, because they are able to link up with um, health companies, they can begin to provide very basic insurance products, which are a way of actually retaining loyalty for customers. So I think we're beginning to think about how do we open this up. But the fundamental issue is around uh, resources in the system. And there are choices. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on regional cardiovascular centers we talked about, but there are consequences and choices of any model. I know also from having, you know, worked and been the government of the UK system, that even when you do have universal access, people actually accessing it is a challenge because you have to work with people to get them to go to the health service at the right time to get the right treatment. So I think we need to work across the sector with individuals to raise their awareness of when they engage in the health sector. We definitely need to look at broad-based models of funding and innovative ones. And we need to think about, as you were saying, your Indian models or cheaper levels of provision and make choices. Because there isn't, a, if there was a simple answer, we would have found it in the health system. So I guess it's about understanding the choices you make, looking at new models, and trying to move this forward with all the political problems that you highlight. Francis, you want to add something? <clears throat> Uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the thing is that uh, the, in, I'm, I'm just speaking about Africa. Uh, in Africa, health insurance got a bad reputation because it didn't deliver. Uh, so there's not a, a much enthusiasm uh, for health care products. Also, the problem is that you can, ha you can insure yourself, but where do you go to? So a lot of the products were designed to actually move patients for tertiary care outside of the country which actually con uh, which com uh, compounds the problem of keeping money within the system. So if you want to, to do something in Africa, that's why I sort of do this big push uh, 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 or just put it on the table for discussion, is that if you want something big, you need to deliver big, which means that if you look at sub-Saharan Africa as a whole rather than countries, regions rather than countries, then you have at least 250 million people that can afford health care. They can contribute at $500 a year per capita, which is a reasonable fee and probably affordable, uh, $175 billion on an annual basis. Now, for $175 billion, you can find insurers and uh, hospital groups who might be interested. Now, even Pro for Provided of, there's no corruption. Well, provided there's no corruption. So the thing is that if you want to do something uh, that it's – and the, my whole argument is based about uh, input neutral to governments. If you take – if you want to ask a government to do more, you're not going to get anything. But if you do – use existing funds in a more organized and a constructive and maybe a supranational region, then you have a, a, a system that could potentially uh, provide services for a much larger component. And that's the one point about insurance. And the other thing is, if you allow for profit service companies like hospital companies to provide, uh, to work for a profit, you can ring fence that tax in order to provide with that money and the equipment within their structures services to the indigent. Um, another, please step up to the microphone. So another question we need to discuss, uh, and maybe, um, and you can, you can elaborate on this a little bit. Um, since you work for Novartis, although, uh, although the foundation, Novartis, of course, needs to make profit, and they also need to make profit in developing countries. I mean, they, they're not going to give medication for free. So the margin, of course, in developing countries is very small. So what is the business model behind this? I mean, how can you and how can a company? You can't. You can't or you don't want? <laughs> Sorry, I represent the Novartis Foundation, not the company, so I can answer, but... Um, for us, um, it is very important that, that um, most patients get access to the innovative drugs that we make and bring to the market. So we do everything we can to reimagine the way to bring it to these people. Novartis Access is one of the examples that Jay has uh, showed where we bring at $1 a month a full treatment for a hypertension or a diabetes patient, which is something people can afford in general. $20 a month they cannot afford, and it's a real problem. But for the foundation, what is more important is that the services that have to be 
be available for patients before they can benefit from the drugs are insufficiently there. And there, I wanted to just reply on a comment of one of the, the, the persons who asked the questions. For me, it's not only the governments that need to get attention on NCDs, because they do have attention for NCDs. They see it as a major problem. It is also the international community. You know that last year, only 2% of all development aid went to non-communicable diseases, and the 98% other went to infectious diseases and mother and child health issues, where the problems are 80% non-communicable diseases in most of the low- and middle-income countries. And added to that, for example, in Africa, um, I believe that when you know in the settings where we work that more than a quarter to a third of the population is, has high blood pressure and has high blood pressure at a much more severe stage at two generations younger sometimes or one generation younger than when we get it, they do their strokes also one generation younger. So in the middle of their prime, in the prime of their lives at 40, 45. So this is what needs to be addressed and ministers of health know that. They just don't have the funding because the, all the funding goes to AIDS and TB and malaria. So it's a, not only a problem of uh, governments but also the international community and definitely neonatal care is more um, it's more impactful if you measure DALIs, but it's not more impactful on, in terms of mortality. So if you look at the overall population, uh, the cardiovascular disease is the main problem. I think this was a very important statement. Um, we have one more question. Uh, my name is uh, Rashid Khaldun. I'm an emergency doctor from uh, MCI University from Austria. So first of all, thank you for the panel, for this uh, input. Uh, and, uh, from one hand, I would like to join the first two colleagues from this audience um, to say that talking about NCDs and access to cardiovascular uh, innovative or healthcare, uh, we need, we know all the impact, death, mortality, uh, inequity of access, and we know also that uh, in Europe, for example, the EU Commission invests a lot in the uh, EU Heart Project in uh, patient-centered uh, medicine uh, and in the, the role of promotion and IT in improving the universal health coverage. But I would like to point out two, two points. First, talking about NCDs, we need more uh, data and deep analysis, some case reports, something, because I think the people here were waiting more for some new plans of action because they know that it's killing, they know it's million, they know that there is a global um, plan of action, but uh, NCDs, it's about self -determin uh, social determinant of health, about determinant of health, and it's related to um, each context, I think, with the African uh, case. We know that uh, NCDs in Africa, it's not like in Asia or South America or in Europe. So first, we need to, what it was mentioned, uh, that uh, it's multi-sector collaboration, and we need to invite all other stakeholders to against poverty, to fight against unemployment, against uh, more condition that people can access to cardiovascular health disease. Then the second point is that this imbalance of care. So we need first to create a harmonization of what is existing, for example, the EU Heart Project in Europe, to try to harmonize it in, in Africa or Middle East or wherever and also to customize the, the action. So my, my question or my, my call, I think it's, um, it's time for some more practical, and what about creating a consortium or a regional committee that can collaborate with, between the different stakeholders and to make the plan more uh, relevant to the context, more feasible and more desirable. Thank you very much. Thank you for this important comment. Uh, we have five more minutes, and uh, I would like to take uh, your point um, about action plans. And, okay, we have one more question, please. 
short. It's very short. I'm Peter Chang on behalf of the Asian Health Literacy, Health Literacy, can I repeat, Association, as well as just newly developed the International Health Literacy Association. And I would like to mention this is because we have been talking about accessibility, but awareness, particularly for NCD, is essentially important. And it's not only for one individual with hypertension and diabetes, because this is going to be a family issue. This is the parents is going to alert the, uh, the, the children, the community. So I'm, I'm hoping that in the future, the health literacy will be integrated in part of this uh, accessibility for the developing country, particularly in South Asia, in Africa, in many parts of the world being neglected about this awareness. Thank you. I'm looking for a comment or uh, feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will ask each of the panelists to give uh, a short summary, very short, and your top three items for an action plan uh, that was requested. We start from the left. I think uh, we need to get a handle on available uh, expenditure uh, in, in Africa and try and work out a, a, a system that's neutral based on existing expenditure and see how we can manage those funds better and retain it within the continent. Probably going through insurance companies and private uh, uh, medical uh, companies, investment in structure and infrastructure and personnel. Jay? So um, I echo the point of, uh, of, of bringing forward uh, more money and financing for health. Um, also trying to make sure that we engage the industry and governments to, to play a role in this and, and really step up their efforts. And I think the third thing that I heard, which is quite important to, to echo, is that you know, we want to move from, you know, we want to continue care for the, for the middle class, but we want to make sure that the poor are also being addressed by some of the non-communicable disease interventions that are, that are at least in people's minds that need to then be implemented in a better way. And? Yes, um, thank you. Microphone. I, oh, sorry. I would like to say industry is engaged in the fight against the NCDs very much, and we look for uh, new models of how to address this. And as an action plan, I am doing a call to companies who want to join us at the Novartis Foundation in a collective approach to address cardiovascular disease in urban uh, underserved populations. So we look for partners in the insurance sector, the digital sector, the food sector, the mobility sector. So that's our action plan. And we are already on the ground in uh, cities in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. So the action plan is already busy. <laughs> Uh, in terms of action, at a national level, there are examples where the NCD Alliance, the global body, has actually got national um, multi-sector partnerships, which are really beginning to get into practical action plans at the local level. So if you're not aware of that, um, I would certainly look at where your national body is that you can join. In terms of practical action on workplaces, again, with the NCD Alliance, we produced a report to highlight case studies of practical action action both for governments, for workplaces and for individuals. Lots of practical examples there and for us we continue to work through our partnerships with other people and through what we practically do um, with the people that we work with. But I think it's absolutely about action and the, finally I would say that health literacy, very important point because it's not just having awareness but it's also having the ability as individuals to be able to act on it so I think we need to bring that into our consideration so that individuals can act too. Thank you. Thank you very much and I think uh, we have a lot of action plans now uh, and I would like to thank the panelists for great presentations and stimulating discussion, also the participants of this session with very good comments and I hope that we will be served a healthy diet uh, at lunchtime. Thank you very much.